Bien, San Alman ha hablado en el evento de i for good esta es su web, ha hablado estos días y bueno, ha traído sobre la mesa algo que estaba candente, que es el tema de la ciberseguridad con la inteligencia artificial generativa, apenas se le está dando impulso a lo que es la ciberseguridad y está claro que debería preocuparle a todo el mundo que tiene una empresa y sobre todo si está utilizando o no este tipo de tecnología porque es eh, todo el mundo susceptible a caer y bueno, abajo tenéis los subtítulos en inglés, arriba los tenéis en español, vamos a ver un poquito de, de la reunión que es bastante interesante. Where we are with AI, where we're going, some of the big questions, and I want to talk about governance. So let's get going with a little bit of table setting. We're in this interesting moment in AI where everybody is aware of the power and the potential, but it hasn't really changed the world yet. It hasn't really changed any of the SDGs and the things we're talking about. I'm not going to ask you when that's going to happen, but instead let me ask you this. What is the first big good thing we'll see happen? And what is the first big bad thing we'll see happen when it starts to really have an impact? So I think the area where we're seeing impact even now uh, is productivity. Uh, software developers are uh, the most commonly cited example, and I think probably still the best one to use, where people can just do their work much faster, more effectively, work more on the parts that they want. And like other sort of technological tools, they become part of a workflow, and then it's it's pretty quickly becomes difficult to imagine working without them. Um, and so I expect that pattern to happen in more areas where we'll see we'll see different industries become much more productive than they used to be because they can use these tools, and that'll sort of have a positive impact on everything from writing code to uh, how people. How, how we teach, how we learn, uh, how healthcare works, uh, and, and it'll see this increase in efficiency. And I think that'll be the first uh, really detectable positive thing. And I, I'd say we're already um, we're already in that. Uh, first negative thing. I, I mean, obviously there are already some negative things happening with the tools. Uh, I would say cybersecurity. I don't know if it'll be the first, but it's one that I want to call particular attention to is something that I, I, I think could be quite a problem. Yeah, that's a that's a, an extremely interesting one. I want to I want to get to some of the underlying questions of that. But first, let me ask you a little bit about the new model you're training. You've just announced that you're have begun training the next iteration, whether it's GPT-5 or whatever you're going to call it. One of the big concerns in this room in Geneva is that GPT-4 and the other large language models are much better at English, Spanish, French than they are at say, Swahili. How important to you is that? How important is language equity as you train the next big iteration of your product? I don't know if that was a tee up or not, but I'll take it. Um, one of the things that we're really pleased with, it? with GPT-40, which we released uh, a couple of weeks ago, is that it is very good at a much, much wider variety of languages. Um, we'll make future ones better and even more, but I think the stat that we announced was like a good coverage for 97% of people for their primary language that they speak. Um, so we were able to think a really big step forward there. Uh, people have been loving that, and we'll continue to push on that further. As, uh, as you train this next iteration, let's, let's, let's stick with the next iteration of a model. As you train it, what level of improvement do you think we're likely to see? Are we likely to see kind of a linear improvement, or are we likely to see asymptotic improvement, or are we likely to see any kind of exponential, very surprising improvement? Great question. Uh, we don't expect that we're near an asymptote, um, but you know, this is like a debate in the world, and I think the best thing for us to do is uh, just show, not tell. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people making a lot of predictions, and I think what we'll try to do is just do the best research we can, um, and then figure out how to responsibly release whatever uh, whatever we're able to create. I expect that it'll be hugely better in some areas and surprisingly not as much better in others, which has been the case with every previous model. But this feels like the conversation we've had every uh, other model release. You know, when we were going from 3 to 3.5 and 3.5 to 4, 
there's a lot of debate about, well, is it really going to be that much better? Uh, if so, in what ways? And the answer is there still seems to be a lot of headroom. Um, and I expect that we will make progress on some things that people didn't expect to be possible on the whole. So this is also the first time you're going to have a model that will be trained in large part on synthetic data. I mean, I presume, because the web now contains lots of synthetic data, meaning data that was created by other large language models. How worried are you that training a large language model on data created by large language models will lead to corruption of the system? I think what you need is high quality data. There is low quality synthetic data, there's low quality human data. Um, and as long as we can find enough quality data to train our models or ways, another thing is ways to train, you know, get better at data efficiency and learn more from smaller amounts of data or any number of other techniques, uh, we're, I think that's okay. And I'd say we feel like we have what we need for this next model. Are you, have you created massive amounts of synthetic data to train your model on? Have you self-generated data for training? We, we of course have done all sorts of experiments, including generating lots of synthetic data. Um, my hope is that there will be, you know, there, there, there'd be something like very strange if the best way to train a model was to just generate like a quadrillion tokens of synthetic data and feed that back in. It would, you'd say that like somehow that seems inefficient and there ought to be something where you can just learn more from the data as you're training. Uh, and, you know, I think we still have a lot to figure out. But, yeah, of course we've generated um, lots of synthetic data to experiment training on that. But, uh, again, I think the real, the core of what you're asking is how can you learn more from less data. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Let's talk about one of, I think, the key questions that will affect how these things go out in the world. Last year you did this fascinating interview with Patrick Collison, uh, the founder of Stripe. And he asked this great question. He said, is there anything that could change an AI that would make you much less concerned that AI will have dramatic bad effects in the world. And you said, well, if we could understand what exactly is happening behind the scenes, if we could understand what is happening with one neuron. And if I understand that, it means like you want the AI model to be able to teach someone chemistry, but you don't want them to be able to teach them to make a chemical weapon. And you wish that you could do that in the guts, not at just the interface level. Is that the right way to think about it? And have you solved this problem? I think that safety is going to require like, like a whole package approach. But this question of interpretability does seem like a useful thing to understand. And there's many levels at which that could work. Uh, we, we certainly have not solved interpretability. There's a number of things going on I'm very excited about, but nothing close to where I would say, yeah, you know, everybody can go home. We've, we've got this figured out. Uh, it does seem to me that the more we can understand what's happening in these models, the better. And, and I think that can be part of this cohesive package to how, how we can make and verify safety claims. But if, you don't understand what's happening, isn't that an argument to not keep releasing new, more powerful models? Well, we don't understand what's happening in your brain at a neuron by neuron level. And yet we know you can like follow some rules and we can ask you to explain why you think something. Uh, there, are, there are other ways to understand a system besides understanding uh, it at, at the sort of neuron by neuron level. Um, the, the characteristics the behavior of these systems is extremely well characterized. Um, and the, you know, one of the things I think that has surprised a lot of people in the field, including me, is the degree to which we have been able to get very quickly and sort of when viewed on the history of a new technology scale, um, these systems to be generally considered safe and robust. My wife also says she sometimes doesn't understand exactly what's happening at a deep level of my brain. So we've, uh, we've got, We've got that, got that, that in common there. What is the most progress we've made, or have there been any real breakthroughs in understanding this question of interpretability? Uh, there was a great release recently from Anthropic um, that 
did a Golden Gate Bridge model that sort of showed off, uh, you know, one, one interesting feature of this. Uh, that would be like a recent thing I would point to. Okay. Well, let me go to a proposal that um, Tristan Harris made this morning. As we're talking about safety, Tristan was on this stage. And he said that for every million dollars that a large language model company puts into making their models more powerful, they should also put a million dollars into safety. One for one. Do you think that's a good idea? I don't know what that means. Uh, like the the death the. I think there's this temptation to break the world into um, capabilities here and safety here, and you can like make all of these nice sounding. You know, we should have this policy and that policy. Uh, but if you if you look at how if you look at the work we've done to actually make a model like GPT-4 used by hundreds of millions of people for increasingly uh, frequent, important, valuable tasks, um, if you look at making that thing uh, safe, you'd have a hard time characterizing where a lot of the work would, would fit. Um, because to, to, if you're using a model in production, you want it to like accomplish your task and not go do something that's going to have a negative effect of some sort, but you don't know, um, like you as a user, you're like, Oh, did this work because it did what I want? Um, did that work because of capabilities work or safety work or something in between, like getting the model to behave that the way the user, the way the user wants in, you know, according to these boundaries, that, that is, it's an integrated thing. It's like, a you know, you get on an airplane, um, I guess this is a bad recent example, but I started, so I'll stick with it. But, but you get on an airplane and you, you, uh, you know, you want to know it'll get you where you want to go. And you also want to know that it's not going to crash on the way. Um, but I think it's, there are some cases in that airplane design where you would say, okay, this was clearly capabilities work and this was clearly safety work, but on the whole, you're trying to, design this integrated system that is going to safely get you where you want to go, hopefully quickly, um, and hopefully not panel fall off during flight. And, and the boundary there is sort of not as clear as it often seems. Fair enough. So in some ways, all of your engineers... Bien, lo dejamos aquí, y bueno, bastante interesante, aunque siempre lo comentan, que el mayor uso de la inteligencia artificial generativa está haciendo son los desarrolladores, está claro porque bueno, al final, aunque departamento de marketing, de ventas o cualquier otro en la empresa lo esté utilizando, en porcentaje siempre va a ser el mundo del desarrollo el que lo utilicen primero porque pues bueno, te genera código, están más abiertos a este tipo de tecnologías y entiendo que en todas las gráficas que tienen las empresas como OpenAI del uso que se les está dando a sus modelos, pues bueno, traquearán esta información y será bastante importante el, el uso que se le está dando para desarrollar código versus cualquier otra actividad económica que se esté haciendo una empresa. Y luego el tema que pensaba que iba a hablar un poquito más del tema de la ciberseguridad, porque me parece que ahora mismo es un sector que se están desarrollando muchísimas cosas con inteligencia artificial generativa y todo lo que conlleva, no solo el descifrar, clave es mucho más sencillo, entrar en sistemas que ahora cualquier persona pues bueno, puede acceder a, a sistemas o entender las, las vulnerabilidades de muchos software, de muchos clientes, entonces entrar ahí va, va a tener que cambiar todo ese sector y luego el tema de si puedes clonar la voz, de hecho estoy haciendo un curso de, de llamadas telefónicas para empresas y básicamente si le cambias el uso en vez de uso comercial, un uso maligno copiando la, la voz, copiando los datos, va a ser un tema que eh, va a generar muchísimos puestos de trabajo en el futuro y, bueno, una buena formación. Y luego, por otro lado, pues bueno, la ha hecho la pregunta de la seguridad. Eh, estaba bien encaminada, lo que no me gusta cuando ya la ha preguntado que si se invierte un millón en, en el modelo debes invertir otro millón en seguridad. ¿Y en qué? ¿Sabes? Es decir, al final eso que es la seguridad, que era lo que le estaba comentando, ahí buena respuesta, está claro que todas estas preguntas pues ya sabe por dónde van a ir, porque al final pues muchos periodistas la acaban copiando, 
pero bastante, bastante interesante lo que ha dicho. Bueno, como siempre, darle a like, comentar y nos vemos mañana.